This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are talking to Matthew Kerner, who is partner GM at Microsoft, working in blockchains and financial services. We'll talk about a recent announcement from Microsoft regarding the Cocoa framework, which uses trusted execution environments in a special way to make consortium blockchain networks. So, Matthew, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So, before we begin, like we'd like to know how how you got interested in blockchains while working at Microsoft? It found me. Uh, what happened was that um, across the company, uh, we were broadly, people within the company were starting to look at blockchain. And uh, it found its way to my team because broadly we owned a set of verticals, including financial services. And so it made sense for us to look at it within the Azure team. And so we borrowed one person from my team, and we thought perhaps it would be a flash in the pan and we would get some things in the marketplace and be done. And as we got involved, we saw that it was a much bigger deal. Uh, and I started spending more and more of my time and got to a point where I sort of couldn't stop reading about it. it was, I was ravenous for information uh, and um, quickly uh, decided that there was a real strategy that we needed across the company here. And so we, we built a team and we're incubating that as a workload now. Uh, working with a variety of customers and partners to see where it takes us. So can you tell us like what your team does exactly? Sure. Uh, my team is responsible for two things. Uh, we're responsible for financial services as a vertical on Azure. And there we look at more than blockchain. That's everything that's required to enable uh, banks, uh, capital markets, insurers, payment providers, and other financial organizations uh, to run on Azure, whether it's a compliance certifications or a certain features that the platform needs to have, or an ecosystem to support that market of, uh, of ISVs and, and SIs. So that's one half of what the team does. And then the other half of what the team does is to work on blockchain as a workload. And that crosses multiple different industries. And there, uh, you know, we're building the blockchain technology uh, in the Azure team that we make available on our cloud. Uh, and we're also responsible for sort of the overall blockchain product strategy for the company, working with a variety of different teams uh, who work with customers and partners uh, to plan out uh, what we'll do. I've got to say, I've been really just very impressed with all of the all the interesting stuff that's been coming out of Microsoft, uh, you know, especially in these recent years, uh, and and just the the level of commitment to uh, to blockchain technologies that's been coming uh, apparently at the CEO level, uh, even Satya, Satya Nadella, you know, coming to events and visiting, uh, you know, startups, uh, uh, you know, in in, uh, in these Microsoft uh, developer events in, like last year here in Paris, and um, and I, I've got the feeling that. You know, a lot of people see Microsoft as like this old incumbent, you know, Windows and like the Steve Ballmer years and even before that. Uh, but I think a lot of people, uh, primarily myself, you know, but <laughs> I think a lot of people like myself think that uh, are ne neglected to realize that Microsoft's changed a lot in the last few years. Um, you know, open sourcing uh, .NET uh, and uh, really dedicating to open source and, and sort of opening the company to all these different technologies. So, um, you know, can you talk to you about us? Talk a little bit about that change, and I think you've been at Microsoft for quite a while. Like, how how has that change perceived internally? Uh, it's a breath of fresh air, and it has changed dramatically. I joined Microsoft in 2001, and to put it in perspective, three weeks after I joined the company, we had the Windows XP ship party, uh, and so it was a very different time. <laughs> I spent a number of years working in Windows, and um, it, it really is a different place now. We're spending a lot more time listening to customers, deeply understanding where they're at. Um, we're seeking to learn, meet customers where they live, um, and it takes us down some paths that the company n traditionally might never have gone down, including open source, as you say, as one trend. Uh, but also, I think the disruption of the on-premises packaged software business shifting to a cloud model is a huge deal uh, that's changed the way we think about enterprise computing. And um, blockchain is one of these emerging things that yet again challenges the models of the way uh, businesses approach their markets and 
businesses approach the technology that enables them to run in those markets and scale. And one of the big um, sort of efforts that Microsoft is working on is helping customers digitally transform their businesses. And we think that blockchain is part of that story, although we're really just at the beginning of it. And uh, certainly it's true that across the company, many leaders uh, see major potential here for this to be a disruptive new uh, technology trend, and we don't want to miss it. Uh, and so we're, we are absolutely investing in a big way, and we're committed to, to seeing this through and, uh, to, uh, and having it take us to places where, honestly, we're not entirely sure what those places are yet. Uh, we'll just have to see. No, no, definitely. Well, on that note, um, you know, it seems that right now, everywhere you look, especially you know, in the last year or so, like in terms of enterprise awareness of blockchains, there's just been like this peak hype cycle um, and, and there's a lot of noise uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of undesired noise so you know from your perspective how should should businesses be thinking about blockchains how could should businesses be thinking about the potential for blockchain technologies and enterprise we think uh, that we are just at the beginning of a sea change here and it really is just the beginning there are so many things still to be sorted out we don't yet in the industry have established patterns of successful production deployments running at scale uh, in an enterprise context that people can reference and learn from. And so uh, I think I think it's I think there are a variety of different postures that a business could take and and, and these postures could apply to any technology trend. If I think for example about cloud, um, if organizations are not aggressively adopting cloud and using it to transform the way their businesses work, they're in trouble because their competitors are likely doing this and their competitors now have an asset that um, that is differentiated and sets them apart. When it comes to blockchain, I think lots of organizations are in a wait and see mode. Uh, and it's not unreasonable for organizations to be there. I, again, as, as I said, I think we're just at the beginning and it takes a certain kind of organization to devote the talent and resources and thought to build a business strategy a set of business processes, a technology plan, and a go-to-market strategy to make blockchain work for them. Uh, and those are the organizations that we most want to be working with closely right now. Uh, and we're, we're, we're aggressively sort of building those relationships with the, with the companies that we see who deeply understand the enterprise, deeply understand their industry, and are investing to take a leadership step with blockchain. And I think the, the payoff that those companies can get if they take that kind of jump is that they establish... Uh, an early market lead. And in many cases, that early market lead can become an unassailable, sustainable advantage over time. So there is a payoff, but I think it takes a lot of effort and cost. And none of the organizations that we talk to, enterprise organizations looking at doing uh, blockchain projects, find it to be a simple, easy uh, process today. And so that, I think, speaks to the opportunity that we have to bring a variety of assets that Microsoft has to bear to make blockchain easier for the enterprise to consume, meeting the assumptions that enterprises have about non-functional requirements, plugging into their existing processes, talent pools, uh, technology platforms. And so that is sort of uh, a major investment area on my team. So in, in your experience, Matthew, uh, when you talk to enterprise clients, what are the key requirements for blockchain platforms that, that come across to Microsoft? And how are they different from the open source public varieties that, sure. that it's we a, find? It's a great question. The, um, I think these requirements are often the same that enterprises, as, the, as the requirements that enterprises have had for a long time when it comes to more traditional technology that they might deploy, like a database. They're interested in scale. They're interested in low latency. They're interested in confidentiality. They want to be able to manage that workload and have policies that govern how that workload is going to run. Um, and so all of those are, are non-functional requirements. And they're just enterprise assumptions. And nowhere in an enterprise are they deploying production workloads without um, meeting those expectations. Then on top of that, specifically when it comes to blockchain, um, we kind of divide our customer base into two sets. There are a small number of organizations who are extremely deep on cryptography and distributed systems, and they want to have a very detailed technical conversation. And so they've got some specific requirements around how blockchain will work for them. Uh, but most customers that we talk to say, look, this blockchain thing is new technology. We don't have the expertise in our organization to be able to consume it. Uh, but we would like to use it because we see the promise of transacting across trust boundaries in a new way. 
where we see a new arrangement for the market that we participate in uh, that we would like to, to bring to fruition. And so they're interested in uh, technology that will make it easy for organizations to uh, plug blockchain into their business as opposed to just doing a technology-oriented proof of concept. And that's one of the places where we end up having a very relevant conversation because we're not only talking about blockchain technology, but we're also talking about a cloud platform that many of these customers are already using. We're already talking about our identity offering with Azure Active Directory that you know over 80% of the Fortune 500 are already on and thousands of SaaS applications integrate with. And we're talking about the productivity platform that thousands of organizations are running on, Office 365, Dynamics, uh, and then partner offerings like uh, the Creative Cloud that that uh, that comes from Adobe, um, and so there are a variety of touch points that we have with enterprises, and they've got requirements down at the bottom. Let's say when it comes to the blockchain tech and cloud platform that are non-functional in nature, and they've got business requirements up at the top to make blockchain consumable by lines of business as opposed to technical wizards with a specialized skill set. And so that's, uh, th those are the conversations that we have with most of the enterprises that we deal with. Okay. So like oh, one of the special things about the COCO framework is that it uses these things which are called TEEs or trusted execution environments. Uh, can you explain what is a trusted execution environment? Sure. Uh, just really briefly, a trusted execution environment is a way of running code that operates on data on a computer that protects um, this process from uh, disclosure to the outside and from tampering from the outside. And if you take the case of a hardware-based TE, like Intel SGX, just as one example, um, the chip enables you to create what's known as an enclave, which has a security boundary around it. And the code and data inside of the enclave is encrypted, except when it is inside of the chip and executing. So the operating system, the local admin, the hypervisor cannot see the plain text data that's inside of the enclave, nor can they tamper with the contents of the enclave without the enclave, the chip detecting it. And then the chip will shut the enclave down and stop it from proceeding if it's been tampered with. Uh, and so you, you, you have this interesting pattern with trusted execution environments where once you create a trusted execution environment, the code inside of that TEE does, or inside of the enclave doesn't trust the OS, and so it can't rely on the operating system for system services that it might normally expect to consume, like threading, memory management, synchronization, and so on. Nor does that code necessarily trust the local admin. And so it's a sort of a different threat model that you can operate with on a computer than you used to be able to do. The other thing that TEEs can do, uh, useful capability, is they can produce what's known as an attestation, uh, which is a blob of data that can be remotely verified that proves that uh, the TEE is in fact a valid TEE and that the data or the code inside of the TEE uh, was initialized in a certain way. So you know essentially what program is running inside of there. And since it's remotely verifiable, you can do things like create a secure connection to a TEE on another machine, uh, establish trust and, and determine that that TEE is in fact the, the thing that you think it is. And what you end up with is basically this remotely verifiable strong identity for code that doesn't assume in its threat model that you trust the local admin or the operating system. And so that capability, we think, is a key foundation for how blockchain can run in the enterprise. So this is a really good uh, visualization, the strong identity for code. So it's essentially a, a TEE is an execution environment that is protected by hardware where um, it, it receives inputs. Those inputs can be encrypted and they are decrypted within the hardware, uh, a computation is executed, and then uh, it, the TEE will produce an output. And that output would um, be uh, accompanied by an attestation, which I presume would have some sort of a signature. Uh, that signature could be like the certificate of the TEE's uh, manufacturer, like Intel. And if you trust that certificate, and if you trust that um, the TEE was in fact produced by Intel, then you can trust that the computation was, in fact, uh, what the attestation had provided. Um, so you can sort of audit the code and have a fairly good, um, well, reasonable um, 
assumption that uh, well this this execution environment uh, did in fact produce the code that or the output that was um, it was programmed to produce. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and I would add, TEs need not be solely based in hardware. Uh, we have one which is built into Windows Server. It's called Windows Server Virtual Secure Mode, or VSM. And so you can have software-based TEs as well. And the benefit of that model, in our case, is uh, it's implemented by the hypervisor. So you don't, for example, have to trust the host OS on a node that's running virtual machines. That host OS can't see the memory contents of enclaves that VSM creates for the VMs only the hypervisor can see it. And so at that point, if you uh, if you are willing to trust Microsoft as the hypervisor provider, you can have a degree of trust um, that, that would go beyond that that you might place, for example, in a hoster. Is that similar to um, something like a ZKP circuit? Yeah, and this is a really interesting comparison. Um, the, the, the comparison of TEEs and other cryptographic models that use just math to provide some of the capabilities, um, well, uh, uh, let's say a, an intersecting set of capabilities with what you get with TEEs. The, the beauty of something like a, a, a zero-knowledge proof or homomorphic encryption um, is that you have a mathematical basis um, for the confidentiality of the data uh, or the correctness of the results that you're getting from a computation. Um, and so even if um, an adversary could completely compromise all the parts of a machine that's verifying one of those proofs. Um, they couldn't get access to the data if the assumptions of the math, the, the cryptographic assumption of, of the math are sound. And the trade-off that um, people accept when they use these sorts of schemes is typically a time and space trade-off. Um, well, there are actually three trade-offs. There's a time trade-off. You know, it can take longer to produce these sorts of cryptographic results than it would take to, to use a TEE to produce the results. It, there can be a space trade-off where the size of the, of the ciphertext or the size of the proof is large enough that it can become an impediment to scale uh, throughput or latency. Um, and then the third trade-off that people make is that sometimes these schemes require that you bootstrap some randomness. And so you have to go through the overhead of a key ceremony to establish randomness if you, if you truly want to um, have a, a trustworthy system. So there are trade-offs. Um, I'd also say that there are, there are some, while it may be mathematically possible to express anything with a zero-knowledge proof, practically speaking, um, there are boundaries. And it can be much easier to accomplish some tasks using a trusted execution environment because the programming model looks very similar to what people are used to today in comparison to some of these cryptographic models where it takes you know, a, a postdoc with a cryptographic background to figure out how to achieve a certain task. And so I think that's a big distinguishing factor. With this background in TEs, maybe we could jump into uh, eventually like what is the Cocoa framework and what it is trying to do. But even before we go to the Cocoa framework, I think one of the one of the one of the interesting questions is like blockchain technology was 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 developed in sort of this decentralized mode where uh, the expectation was that there would be like multiple nodes that would be controlled by different people working together to create something like which is trying to be trustless. Now like with, with Microsoft, like when Microsoft is trying to offer, say, blockchain as a service uh, platforms, then the assumption becomes that like all of the cloud nodes are like hosted by Microsoft. They might be running T TEEs and uh, this is some form of executional guarantee might be given. But uh, if all of the nodes are on the cloud, uh, controlled by one, like one or two different corporations, does like blockchains preserve its trust model in any way? I think this topic is really interesting. Uh, and I think that um, we're also at the beginning of this debate and we're going to see where it takes us. I will say we do not operate with the assumption that blockchain networks that run in Azure run entirely in Azure. Um, I think that that would just be silly. We would not be meeting customers where they live. The nature of blockchain is, at least in the enterprise, we think it's at its best when it's used to cross organizational boundaries where there isn't universal trust. And 
that means that consortiums are going to form. And those consortiums will undoubtedly include participants who choose to use a variety of different cloud providers or run things on premises. And so our sort of beginning assumption on anything that we do in blockchain is we need to make consortiums work really well with Azure, which means accommodating infrastructure that runs elsewhere. Uh, so right off the bat, I would assume it's not a world where everything is centralized on Azure at the very least. Um, you know, one option, of course, that we make available is if people like the facilities that we provide to make it easy to run blockchain on Azure, they can run that same set of things on Azure Stack, which is our on-premises appliance that combines hardware plus software to give the same sort of Azure deployment model that we have in the cloud, but lets you do it in your own data center under your own control with your own network connection or what have you. And so we have customers who are putting these things on cruise ships, in mines, on the factory floor, in regions of the world where we don't currently have a, 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 a hyperscale cloud presence. And so they're solving lots of different problems with Azure Stack. And, and certainly blockchain is one workload that we think is important to support in that configuration as well. Then I think the next question is, um, uh, what are the assumptions of the, of the workload that's running on top of blockchain? Um, there are public networks, and those public networks are expressly designed to be fully decentralized, not, not take any dependency on any sort of centralized authority. And, you know, public clouds might be useful for dev tests. They might be useful for running certain utilities that the public networks consume. Um, and we may be able to do lots of work to make the development experience easier for public networks. But I think that those will continue to be decentralized in the way that they are today. Enterprises, however, operate in a different world. They're not typically operating in a market where they're performing anonymous transactions between uh, arbitrary counterparties. Usually they're operating in markets where they have a name, they have an address, they have a business license, they're subject to law enforcement, they're subject to the jurisdiction of one court or another. Uh, and today, you know, the, the, all of these non-technical controls govern the way that, that enterprises behave, and I believe that that will be true for the foreseeable future. So the assumptions for enterprises going in are a little bit different. And they may not be looking for the same set of, um, of uh, decentralization guarantees that people seek on the public networks. Uh, now, by the way, it doesn't mean that enterprises don't worry about their cloud providers. They certainly do. And one of the reasons that we have invested so heavily in Azure's compliance posture um, uh, getting dozens and dozens of certifications is because we want any customer in any industry, in any geography, to be able to use our cloud. And certainly compliance is a part of that, but it's more than compliance. It's also the terms of service and the way that we conduct ourselves. And so, you know, certainly people have been following the Microsoft Ireland case where we successfully fought to avoid serving a warrant for data that was held um, internationally based on a court order in the US, we said that we wanted that to be served by, uh, we wanted to be served with a warrant in the jurisdiction where the data was held and we went all the way to the Supreme Court with that. And so we are very serious about running our cloud in a way that um, enables our customers to trust us, both individuals and enterprises. Um, I guess the, the last thing that I would say is, um, we think that trusted execution environments are uh, an exciting development in the history of cloud. And we think that the, the, the point at which TEEs become widespread, it will be a watershed moment uh, if we look back in history of cloud computing, because for the first time, customers will be able to um, put their data in the cloud, put their compute in the cloud, but not have to assume that the cloud provider is going to um, behave in a certain way. They'll be able to leverage their trust in the trusted execution environment to get the results that they want. Uh, you know, if you think about this, just imagine that you had some health data of yours, and let's suppose that there was a, a cloud-based service that you wanted to run that would enable you and others to provide your personal health data, uh, run an algorithm on that data, and then give you back a result that would tell you if you are um, uh, at risk of, of, of acquiring a certain disease. Well, um, you could encrypt your data to a key that is available inside of a trusted execution environment on the cloud. You could upload your ciphertext. The cloud could take that and process it inside of the trusted execution environment where, let's say, the hardware boundary prevents the cloud operator from seeing that data in the clear. And then the TEE could take the result and write it back out in ciphertext. And you could take that and then you could decrypt it you know, on your own device and see what the result is. And at no point in time, 
was the data ever uh, in the clear for the cloud provider to see. And so we think from a confidentiality and integrity standpoint, trust execution environments enable us to sort of cross a, a boundary that we've never been able to cross before. Of course, you still do rely on the cloud for availability, for performance, for durability of the data in that scenario. But maybe those are characteristics that enterprises are willing to trust Microsoft to provide in return for the elasticity, uh, the agility, the set of services that are made available, you know, in, in, in uh, dozens of regions around the world at hyperscale. Uh, and so I, we think that that trade-off uh, is fundamentally attractive to people uh, in enterprises, uh, decision makers in enterprises. And, and so that's why we think that blockchain has a role uh, in Azure. Well, let's uh, let's get right into it. Then the Cocoa framework. Um, so, what is the Cocoa framework, and can you perhaps describe uh, that uh, that stack of technologies or um, or the architecture of the Cocoa framework? Sure. Um, uh, enterprises everywhere are um, curious to see how blockchain can be used to transform their markets and their business. And as we talk with them one of the very first concerns that they raise is that they're used to a set of non-functional requirements that are standard across their entire IT portfolio. They expect certain levels of scalability, low latency, they expect confidentiality of the data that they put into those systems, and they expect to be able to govern and manage those systems. And those four basic assumptions are enterprise non-functional requirements that are really non-negotiable. Um, and if we look at any enterprise product that we produce, um, those are a key ship criteria for us uh, and operational criteria over time. Um, the challenge with uh, blockchain is that it was developed as technology to run in a public network across heterogeneous machines and uh, uh, with, with a, a threat model that assumed that any individual party in the network could be malicious. And that threat model is a Byzantine threat model. In other words, it assumes that any of the counterparties can replace the code running on their node with arbitrary malicious code of their choosing that could try to cause the system to fail you know, uh, in any sort of way, including through security failures. Uh, and so the protocols that blockchain needed to use in order to operate in this hostile threat environment um, were uh, resource intensive protocols that also, uh, at least uh, to date, have required the vast majority of the data in the blockchain to be stored in the clear for all participants to see. Um, the governance model is also very basic. It, is, it basically comes down to the decision of what code is run on each of the mining nodes in these public networks. And when we talk with enterprises, they feel that the scalability, latency, confidentiality, and governance trade-offs that they make with blockchain are oftentimes too great for them to consider it for any kind of real production use. And we heard that feedback enough uh, from customers and also internally from experts within Microsoft who've been working on enterprise computing for you know 20 or 30 years in some cases, that we felt that there was something that ought to be done about that. And, that and, and we felt that none of the solutions that were out there in the market really hit the enterprise design point uh, in a, in a squarely and in a head-on way. And so we uh, started working on the Cocoa framework, and it, it was an idea that came jointly sort of out of some thinking from Mark Rosinovich, who's the Azure CTO, and Microsoft Research, where we have a number of people looking at blockchain broadly. Uh, and, uh, and the basic idea of the Cocoa framework is, first of all, it's not a ledger. Uh, if you want to run a ledger, you need to use a ledger. Uh, Cocoa is a framework that enables many or any ledger to integrate on top of it. And Cocoa takes on the job of forming a secure, high-performance, high-throughput network that implements a la basic layer of governance and then enables the ledger to bring its ledger model to bear um, with whatever abstractions the ledger might like to use. Uh, and it brings these set of enterprise capabilities to that ledger. Scalability that can handle thousands of transactions per second, latency where we can process transactions in milliseconds rather than, rather than waiting seconds or minutes, uh, arbitrary confidentiality models for fine-grained role-based access to data, and governance that enables a consortium of enterprises to decide what rules they're going to follow and who's going to get to participate in a structured way. And so Coco seeks to be this um, ubiquitous network fabric for multiple different flavors of enterprise blockchains built by a variety of different ledgers across 
uh, industry verticals. And, and our hope and intent is that COCO will enable enterprises to consume blockchain without having to compromise on any of their basic non-functional requirements. Okay, so if, uh, I'll try to, try to state the same thing uh, in my own words. So like with any blockchains, with any blockchain, like with any, with any public blockchain, there are generally like three or four, like four main components to it, right? So, so the first is like this networking layer. So there's this, generally this gossip network, which are nodes like communicating all of these messages. Then there's the consensus layer or consensus uh, piece, which is like once you have these nodes and they're communicating with each other, how they arrive at consensus on, um, on like changes to whatever data set they're tracking. And then the third thing is like a transaction layer, which is like, what do the transactions enable the users to do? So there's some kind of transaction logic to it. And the fourth might be like a, a governance layer. So how do you handle ch upgrades to the, to the network, uh, to the network consensus or transaction logic? So the way like I see Coco is, uh, Coco is trying to build just the networking, governance, and consensus systems and on top of it anyone can plug in their own transaction types or or ledger types yeah it's a good question coco is certainly seeking to solve that networking layer problem it also will come out of the box with a variety of consensus options and so it can handle consensus for a ledger if the ledger wants to to delegate that um, it does not uh, uh, concern itself with the content of transactions per se. That's the ledger's job. But it also does have something to say about governance, although I don't expect that COCO will ultimately be the sole answer to governance and consortium networks. I think COCO will be, res be able to be responsible for some low-level governance about the basic sort of substrate of that consortium. And then higher ap application level governance also needs to apply. Just as a, as a very simple example, suppose we're talking about a blockchain that implements smart contracts. Coco doesn't say anything about which smart contracts the consortium members are going to use for their business processes. But it does say something about what ledger code versions those enterprises are going to run and who's gonna get to participate. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So tell us, like, how, how do you expect like enterprises to use the Coco framework? So let's assume, like, let's assume like a group of enterprises is wanting to build like a, a consortium blockchain for a supply chain application. So is it the case that they can just take the Coco framework, like choose a particular flavor of, uh, of ledger, right? Like, like pick, pick an Ethereum like ledger system or Corda like ledger system or whatever, and then mix and merge the two and then deploy their application. I think supply chain is a great example. I would, let's just start with some of the things that a supply chain consortium might like to do. Um, you might like to have buyers who are going to submit orders for goods. And you might have, have suppliers who are fulfilling those orders. And then there are a variety of people who are responsible for transportation, customs, uh, and so on. And then there's maybe another layer of services that are provided in a supply chain consortium that, that has to do with trade finance, where for any one of these orders, the buyer is really only going to want to pay for it once the goods are received. Uh, but the supplier is going to need cash in order to manufacture the goods and ship them. And so there's this gap. And so supply chain financiers 
will extend credit to suppliers in order to do this. And then they, you know, they have to determine the terms of that loan. What interest rate are they going to charge? Uh, what contingencies are there in the loan? And usually they try to get data on the history of those suppliers and also the history of the buyers to determine their credit worthiness. Uh, and today, uh, a lot of this happens on paper, fax machines, wet signatures, phone calls. Uh, it's in extremely tedious and there's a tremendous amount of friction. And much of this data is today, at least in supply chain, shared point to point through uh, protocols like EDI. And it's extremely inefficient and troublesome for people to make sure that they're in sync. So I think that there's a compelling value proposition for a supply chain consortium to adopt a distributed ledger. But I think one of the first problems that you would see and, and by the way, this use case is interesting because um, this is one of these things that moves at the speed of physical goods. Here, we're not talking about some digital bear instrument with high frequency trading. That's not the use case, although there is such a use case. In this case, we're talking about things that get shipped. Um, you know, a phone call is probably actually faster than the supply chain. So it, it moves above the speed, below the speed of humans. So we're not so worried about the performance you know, scalability and latency aspects here. But I think any supply chain consortium would immediately be disturbed by the prospect of having the data from buyers visible to all buyers and all suppliers. What goods are they purchasing? From whom? At what price? At what time? If, uh, if we knew that about our competitors when it came to, for example, the cloud supply chain, that would be a tremendously valuable data point for us. Uh, and so we keep that that's very proprietary information for us, and we expect our suppliers to treat it as proprietary information as well. And I think as any supply chain consortium would have the same concern. But think, keep in mind, you then have these uh, trade finance providers who are trying to extend loans. And so both buyers and suppliers have an interest in making data available about how much business they've done, let's say, in the past 12 months, what percentage of the time that did they deliver on time uh, the right set of goods. Uh, and and by sharing that, they can get better terms for trade finance loans. And by getting better terms for trade finance loans, the, the cost that the buyer has to pay ultimately for the goods goes down and the margin for the supplier goes up. So everybody has an incentive in sharing that data. Uh, they also have an incentive in being in sync on exactly where the goods are. Did they already leave the factory? Are they on a truck? Where is the truck? Has the truck gone through customs? Have the things been tampered with? Um, did the number arrive that were expected? Was it the same set of items that were in the lot that was shipped? All of these things, getting in sync on that can be tremendously tedious. And we know from our own business as a corporate, Microsoft's own business, that this can be an extremely tedious process. And then typically, you know, traditionally people would be on the phone uh, working with spread, their in individual copies of spreadsheets to try to verify all of this stuff. So there's absolutely a business case to remove friction from the system and to introduce uh, a new model for trade finance with better financing terms based on verifiable data that's in sync across all the counterparties. But I think confidentiality is a major issue for any supply chain consortium. I'm not sure that governance is quite as important. In other words, unlike, uh, let's say, a banking consortium, a supply chain consortium might not have to worry as much about who's permitted to transact with each other. They may not have the same KYC requirements. But of course, uh, if I'm a company in the US and I'm doing business with a supplier, uh, I'd be mortified to learn that my supplier was actually a sanctioned organization. So I might very well want to do some basic uh, KYC AML checks on the set of people who are participating in the consortium. So I do think governance is relevant, although perhaps not as relevant. So let's let's just um, to stay on this topic of uh, of scalability and confidentiality, because I think that for for enterprise, these are probably the two most important characteristics that they're going to be looking for in a, a blockchain. Um, and so, can you explain then how? Uh, 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 a cocoa framework enabled blockchain network, uh, so to speak, achieves this high level of scalability. I mean, I saw this uh, Mark Rasinovich uh, demo, which we'll um, we'll link to in the show notes, where we're running an EVM, uh, and you know, there's just like thousands of transactions per second. It just you know, it goes and the the transaction odometer just goes off the rails, uh, and. Uh, and so, yeah, let's let's address that, and also address how we can achieve transaction confidentiality when you know everybody knows that uh, you know, on the public Ethereum network, uh, it's uh, nearly you know it's 
theoretically impossible to achieve a transaction. Uh, in the current um, implementation of Ethereum, it's impossible to achieve a transaction confidentiality. Sure. So, so in this in this consortium example, um, the the way that we can do this is first of all the consortium picks a ledger, and we've announced uh, several that intend to integrate with Coco, uh, and are working with several others that where we're not yet ready to, to to announce anything. So they'd pick their ledger, and that ledger would would um, incorporate the Coco framework into its distribution. And what Coco does is it makes it changes one very basic assumption among the blockchains. We do not assume that the participants in the consortium trust each other. They can be adversarial, that's fine. But we do assume that we can create a trusted network of nodes that represent those members of the consortium. And the way that we do that is by leveraging the trusted execution environment. So we create on each node that's a member of the network an enclave. That enclave is running the ledger code and some Cocoa management code. Those enclaves connect to each other. They exchange attestations. And now each of those enclaves knows what the other one is running. And they can verify that the party on the other end has not replaced the code with the malicious code of their choice. They're, in fact, running the, the expected code that the consortium has decided that they're going to run. And once you make that assumption, again, we're not assuming that the members trust each other. We are assuming that those members can't tamper with the contents of the enclaves that they own. And we're assuming that the enclaves themselves are producing valid attestations. Once those enclaves form that network, we can use much more traditional distributed systems protocols to achieve things like consensus and data replication. Uh, and those traditional distributed systems protocols, in addition to just being proven over the course of dozens of years of operation at scale, they also provide much better characteristics in terms of latency and in terms of throughput. And so we can achieve scale like you'd expect from a database in the case of blockchain by using trusted execution environments to set up this particular kind of trust relationship among the nodes. Confidentiality is the other thing that we can achieve. Again, the data in the case of these trusted execution environments is only ever in the clear inside of the trusted execution environment, meaning that the local admin can't see the contents of all the transactions flowing through the system. They have to make a request through an API to read data. And when they do that, um, that API can choose what data to show to each of the individual counterparties who are participating in the consortium. And now, instead of having to use very fancy cryptography that might have a time or space trade-off or might require unique cryptographic knowledge on the part of the people implementing the system, you can have a standard enterprise developer write some logic that says, in my consortium, or, or, or for this order, I'm going to make the order visible in its entirety to the buyer who placed the order and to the seller who's been selected to fulfill the order. And I'm going to surface metadata about the order, like the total value of the order, uh, whether it was delivered on time. I'm going to surface that to any caller who has a role that's a, a trade finance role. And now you've got this very fine-grained RBAC. It's standard RBAC uh, role-based access control that any enterprise developer would use today. They set a, you know, an access control list or they write rules about who can see what data. And then the code just implements those rules. And since the code is running inside of the trusted execution environment, it can't be tampered with. Since the data is only unclear inside of the trusted execution environment, it can't be read from the outside. And now all of a sudden you've got uh, a consortium that can run at the scale of a database with the latency of a database and have this arbitrary fine-grained confidentiality it's really not clear to me how that scheme could be implemented using ZK snarks or homomorphic encryption. It would be a real challenge to come up with this, especially this fine-grained confidentiality for that supply chain consortium scenario. This is this is amazing because back in 2015, so prior to 2015, there was no notion of enterprise blockchains at all. Like, like I think enterprise blockchains, like consortium chains, really started in 2015. And the biggest problem they faced was the problem of like privacy, the blockchain model requiring all of the transactions broadcast uh, in order to be visible to all of the consortium parties. And traditionally, traditionally the solution, the proposed solution to it has always been some form of zero knowledge proofs. But zero knowledge proofs are are very limited in in, in what they can do. So. This, this almost seems like a holy grail, right? Like you're taking components like trusted execution environments, which are, which are available, and then able to build a blockchain 
like consortium chain platform in which privacy of data can be guaranteed by only rules role role based access uh, this seems something which, which is like very powerful we think so we think that it addresses the key things that our enterprise customers are telling us they want out of blockchain and by the way using coco doesn't mean that you have to give up on all of those other techniques uh, one of the ledgers that's publicly expressed their intent to integrate Coco is uh, Quorum, which was built by J.P. Morgan Chase and is this open source ledger that's sort of a, a modification of Ethereum for the enterprise. And Quorum already uses point-to-point -point encryption with its constellation system to enable private transactions among a subset of members of a consortium. And Quorum already has on its roadmap the desire to incorporate other kinds of um, uh, cryptography like uh, the the ZSL uh, uh, from that that derives from uh, these knowledge, zero knowledge proofs that derive from the public networks, um, and uh, they're going to keep those systems and those will be available to use selectively for use cases as a consortium sees fit. And Coco will be yet another layer that enables consortiums to achieve what they would like. And so this is not meant to be sort of a, uh, the, the one single answer that's suitable for everything. People will use crypto cryptography where it makes sense. They'll use the um, trust execution, execution environments wherever it makes sense. Uh, and so we think that people are going to start being able to mix and match to address their business requirements. So, uh, so, so just to recap, just to just to test my understanding. So, what Cocoa can allow enterprises to do is like let's assume all three of us are enterprises in our supply chain example. So, I don't know. I'm I'm like a shipping company. Sebastian, uh, uh, you I are fish like lobster. a yeah, fish lobster, and and like uh, uh, Matthew, you you buy some 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 things in bulk and. Uh, Sebastian is a like a, is a financing company, and all of us are on one like blockchain ledger, which is running on the Coco framework. So me as me as one of the participants, I have to assume. So what what, what do we need to assume? We need to assume that all of us are willing to r run our nodes on these trusted execution environments. And once we assume that, it gives me the power to input some data into into the into the consortium chain have all of these nodes running trusted execution environments come to consensus on that data and also allows me to selectively only selectively reveal my data to the other consortium participants so i can have a mechanism by which i choose to reveal my data to sebastian but not to matthew that's exactly right and by the way, it, it, it can be even finer grains than revealing my data to Sebastian and not to Matthew. It could be, I'm going to reveal, um, you know, the date of the order to Matthew and the quantity of the order and the date of the order to Sebastian. And, um, you know, you could come up with as fine grained a model as you like. Uh, and one of the components of the demo um, uh, in the video that we show is... Um, is this application, uh, physics application that's built by a, a, a company called Mojix that, that is a supply chain, blockchain-based supply chain management application. Uh, and in order to build that application on top of, we, so what we did in the demo is we took the C++ Ethereum code base and we um, replatformed it to run on top of Coco, but it still has the very same set of interfaces externally that it had originally, and it has the same execution model inside of the EVM for transactions. And so all that Mojix had to do, uh, first of all, they, they, they removed all public data from their smart contract definitions, so you can't read the data directly. And then um, they implemented access control logic in each of their smart contracts where you could read data that just checked the, um, the whoever submitted the transaction against an access control list to see who's allowed to see the data. And that enabled them to achieve this fine-grained confidentiality. It's all done in the idiom of the ledger. Coco underneath provides kind of the core capability to make it work, uh, but, it, but it ends up being very flexible. And they really, we, we also, we had to um, disable a couple of APIs, those APIs that enable raw read access to the transactional history or raw read access to uh, enterprise or to smart contract state. Um, 
those had to be disabled uh, in order to prevent people from circumventing the logic inside of the smart contracts. But it was a very simple change. It's not as though we we um, we had to break things in a major way. So they basically just had to pipe their reads through the smart contract methods, and then all of that access control logic applies. Just 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 a, a question on what happens when something goes wrong. Like for example, you have a smart contract, right? And it turns out that, uh, let's assume that smart contract is also handling financial value. And now there's a bug in the contract. And because of that bug, uh, that smart contract is leaking value to some people who shouldn't have access to it. Now somebody needs to fix that contract. So do they get like, like so whoever is trying to fix it, do they get like access to all of the data handled by the smart contract? Yeah, this is a great question. Um... Uh, and, and let me sort of work my way into it. First of all, before, before anyone uses uh, uh, Coco, they need to do a threat model. They need to look at the particular business they want to run in their consortium and decide what, what trusted execution environments might be suitable um, for handling that data because different TEEs have different characteristics. And so that's sort of step one. And I, I imagine there will be some workloads that are not suitable for Coco, and that's fine. Um, the next thing is... Um, uh, we assume breach. Uh, in Azure, we assume breach. At Microsoft, we assume breach. We just assume breach, and we've got to make sure that things work the way the customers should expect, even when breach occurs. Um, and so that means we have to assume that a TEE can be compromised. At a, at even and, and that's a, a much worse failure than a smart contract having a defect, because TEE compromise uh, would expose everything in le if, if we approached it in a naive way. And so our, 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 our design uh, seeks to do several things. First of all, minimize the possibility that a breach occurs. Second of all, make it easy to detect if a breach occurs. And third of all, minimize the blast radius when a breach occurs and, and, so that, and, and make it possible for people to recover. Um, so th the first thing is um, we're sort of working with Microsoft Research on a, a variety of um, techniques to avoid bad code failures inside of trusted execution environments. And so Microsoft Research has published some papers on this, that there are uh, compiler techniques, uh, static and dynamic analysis that can prevent data from leaking outside of a T, even if there's a compromise inside of the T. So there are some classes of bugs that we can just eliminate up front. The next thing is um, I worry about the size of the trusted computing base inside of the T inside of the enclave. And so in our design, we, we, will, we will end up with a model where we have actually multiple different enclaves running at the same time on each node. There's an enclave that runs the Coco management software, which is a relatively small code base. It's carefully audited, and it's consistent across all integrations with Coco. And then there's another enclave that runs the ledger code base. And that code base could be potentially larger. That will vary by ledger. It might be a varying quality depending on which ledger you're talking about. And so we've now reduced attack surface because all of the key material, for example, can be stored inside of the smaller, more trusted computing base. And only data is uh, and code related to the ledger are stored in the other one. The next thing we did is we designed a threshold encryption scheme. And the idea here is if somebody were to be able to compromise an individual node, we wouldn't want them to be able to decrypt the entire ledger and then run off with it. Uh, and so there, this, this threshold encryption uh, lets you um, generate a group public key. And that group public key lets any of the nodes encrypt data efficiently. Uh, and then in order to decrypt, um, you need a quorum of nodes to, to each perform a partial decryption, and those decryption shares can be combined to uh, reveal the plain text. And what that means is uh, if you've got one counterparty who uh, somehow compromises a TEE and they want to decrypt the entire ledger, they need the cooperation of a quorum of other counterparties in order to actually get to the data. And so that enables those counterparties to have policies like rate limiting the number of decryptions that anyone can do. And if that rate limit is, is exceeded, they can alert. Um, uh, 
And it was very important to us, by the way, that um, that we did enable sort of offline decryption by a quorum because there's a disaster recovery scenario where you no longer have the TEs that were storing the keys that were being used, and you need all of those members to be able to collude, this time for legitimate purposes, to rehydrate the ledger in new infrastructure so that it can continue to run. Uh, and so there's a variety of different measures that we took to model the possibility that a TE could be compromised and to be able to detect it. You can, for example, have TEs reattest periodically. You can roll over the keys that individual members are using. And so ultimately, we envision that all of these countermeasures will be controllable by policy. Um, there's, there's also a question when it comes to the consensus model that's used in this network. In blockchain today, of course, uh, with, let's say, proof of work, every single node, um, and even proof of stake, every single node is gonna re-execute all of the transactions in a block in order to verify that they're valid before accepting that block on the chain. That requires them to be able to re-execute those transactions, so the data has to be in the clear. And you have this performance overhead uh, and, and this sort of energy consumption overhead. And so we, we think that there will ultimately be a variety of different consensus models available in COCO, including proof of work. By the way, there's no reason you couldn't do that if you wanted it inside of a COCO uh, uh, deployment. But we think that there are some interesting consensus models that could come out where, for example, you could elect a leader. And then that leader is the only one who ever has to execute a transaction. Once the leader executes the transaction, it takes the resulting state changes and broadcasts it to all of the other participants in uh, in the network, and those participants just blindly accept the state changes from the leader and commit them. Uh, and this is a, a, a pretty high throughput model. It's sort of consistent with what you might get in a system like Paxos, uh, where you'd have a replica set and you'd want a quorum of replicas to, to, to commit the data before you consider a transaction valid so that it's durable. Um, but this is a, in, this, in, in, the, in this model, you're only worrying about crashes. You're not worrying about Byzantine adversaries with um, who are running uh, malicious code. Now, uh, even in this model, you can assume that maybe some of the members in the network could somehow compromise a TE and become malicious. And, and so there, you might want to have a model where uh, asynchronously, let's say, you have a set of nodes who are responsible for fully validating every single transaction that, that they see. So a leader is still the one responsible for broadcasting the state changes. The majority of nodes synchronously accept those state changes and move on. And then asynchronously, you have some other nodes checking to make sure that the leader has not gone off the reservation and done the wrong thing. And if, of course, if, if, if any of the nodes does detect a violation, um, they can alert and you can rewind the ledger back to the, to the last uh, agreed upon state. You, perhaps you kick out the bad actor and then, you can, and then you continue. So we do assume that there are these problems down at the ledger layer and we have a variety of defense and depth measures to uh, reduce the likelihood of a catastrophic failure there. We actually don't do anything to address the failure scenario that you described, which is a bug in a smart contract. That is entirely an application level concern. And the COCO framework in and of itself doesn't really uh, know or care about that. And so that would be a problem that the participants would have to sort out amongst themselves. And by the way, that I don't think that's a solved problem either. And it's a very interesting one. Well, perhaps that's a good uh, segue into, um, into governance. And uh, so the, the framework uh, and I thought this was one of the most interesting parts of the framework, talks about uh, um, the governance model and the way that you deploy a network. Um, so Cocoa Framework has within it uh, dis a description of how uh, consortium members can deploy a network uh, with just with just one node, with just one consortium member sort of um, initializing the network and then other members coming on board. Uh, can you walk us through... Uh, you know, let's let's keep on this uh, on this supply chain example. Uh, let's say I'm I don't know Walmart, and I want to init initialize this network and then start bringing on uh, trade finance actors, um, suppliers, uh, transport companies, you know, and, and all of the different um, participants in the supply chain. How would I, as you know, Walmart, for instance, uh, deploy a, a network using the Cocoa framework? Uh, it's, it's a, this is a great question, um, and it starts with some basic agreement on the parameters that all of the members are going to use. They have, they have to pick a ledger. Uh, it's not as though Coco is like a lingua franca, betu franca between ledgers. We're not attempting to solve that problem. Um, so you have to pick your ledger, 
and you've all got to agree on the code version of the ledger that you want to use, and you've all got to agree on who is going to participate, at least at the beginning. You can have changes there over time, but there's got to be some initial set of members that you're going to choose to do business with. Uh, and then you're going to have to agree on a variety of settings that relate to Coco, like what trusted execution environments you're going to be willing to accept. Do you only want hardware ones? Do you want software ones? Which ones? Uh, and, for example, you need to agree on a threshold for voting among the members. Uh, do you require unanimity in order to approve new members? Do you need a, a simple majority? Do you need just some other threshold, M of N? It could be arbitrary. And so each of the members is then going to set up an environment for themselves. And in each environment, they're going to initialize their own COCO node. Uh, in order to do that, they um, they initialize the, the code, and then they connect to the enclave over a secure channel. And they would probably, the very first thing they'd like to do is they'd like to inspect the attestation that the enclave gives back to make sure that the enclave that they ended up with is actually the one that they wanted. And, for, and there wasn't a malicious actor somehow resident on the node who injected some other malicious code inside of the enclave. So you say, okay, hey, look, let's just say, for example, it's running on an Intel SGX uh, uh, a capable chip, and so you have a, an enclave, and and there's an attestation that that looks to be valid, and you see that the code running inside is in fact represented by the hash of the Cocoa framework that you expected, and so then um, that member is going to um, feed the initial configuration into that node, saying here are the other counterparties that I'm doing business with, and here are the public keys that are that that represent each one of them, and then that node is going to connect to the other nodes in the network. Um, using, for example, just a, a, a DNS to find them, uh, and, and it will initialize connections, and those will be TLS connections. And then these nodes exchange a variety of data. They exchange attestations, so they determine that each of them is running TEEs, and they determine the code that's running inside. And they're, in the COCO configuration are the set of allowed code versions and allowed TEEs that are expected. And so once the, uh, the nodes have, have, have performed this validation, they're ready to go ahead, and so they then initialize processing on the ledger. Um, uh, all of this metadata that describes how the network should be formed and what settings are expected, we call the network constitution. And that network constitution is meant to represent all of the infrastructure level decisions about uh, who can participate and how they can participate. And members are only accepted into the network, and those connections and are only considered to be trusted if the rules of the Constitution uh, are satisfied. Uh, and that is sort of how the initial state looks in a COCO network. So uh, if, if a particular COCO uh, network is deployed with a certain Constitution, uh, do you expect there to be a lot of changes to this, to, to, to this Constitution? And like, how do you think the governance process for these changes would look like? I think that... Um, this notion of a consortium model uh, is tremendously powerful, and that it will uh, it, it will disrupt multiple industries. But I also think it's poorly studied and poorly understood today, um, at least by those of us working on blockchain. Um, I think there are other consortiums in existence that have been around for a long time. That are very well understood. Think about a payment network like I don't know, like a Visa or a Mastercard. That's essentially a consortium of banks and financial institutions, uh, and and you know it's it's not managed in this way. In particular, there's one trusted party that runs it. I think that there's uh, th this is a very rich area for new insight and innovation, and also services that will make it possible to run consortiums efficiently. But I think, you know, to begin with, and by the way, many of those consortium management problems are at the application level, as in the example that you gave before about a, a faulty smart contract. But when it comes to the infrastructure, the consortium has a life cycle. Members may come and members may go, and the software used and even the TEEs used by the members will iterate over time. And so those are the basic rhythms by which I believe that the Constitution is likely to change. There may be other policy changes, like you might choose a different M of N threshold at some point in time, but that feels less likely to me. I think the common thing that will happen is a consortium will get started with a certain set of members. They'll get it off the ground and they'll run it for a period of time. And once it's the kinks are ironed out and they're ready to scale it, they'll bring other people in. And at that point, they'll have votes to bring in new members. Um, they'll have 
you know, the, the, the manufacturers of the ledgers will have new versions of the ledgers that fix bugs or add new capabilities. And in some cases, they will carry a Cocoa payload that changes um, the, the functionality that the Cocoa framework provides for that ledger. And so these are all updates that need to be applied and can only be applied if the network constitution uh, is updated to accept them. Uh, and so we imagine there will be lots of uh, interesting scenarios around this governance where, where uh, consortiums will decide, hey, I, I just want to accept any new um, uh, distribution that, let's say, is signed by R3 from the, from the quarter team. And so any, any signed R3 payload ought to be able to run. Well, that ultimately needs to be able to be expressed as a COCA policy, not something that we would have in our V1, but something that we would work towards over time. And so we'll try to remove the friction from these basic changes that would happen in the network. This is really fascinating. I mean, I can see how uh, you know any any enterprise uh, consortium um, looking to launch a blockchain network could could find a lot of the properties and a lot of functionalities that they would need for production networks within uh, within Cocoa. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm definitely going to keep keep uh, looking into this and I'm looking forward to seeing how this develops. Um, but we're nearly at the end of our nearly at the end of the show. Uh, but uh, so I've got a couple of other questions. So one is, uh, so we had uh, Marley Gray on uh, uh, a few months ago to talk about uh, Project Bletchley. So could you just briefly just perhaps um, tell us, if, is this connected to Project Bletchley in any way? Is, is there any overlap there with uh, other initiatives at Microsoft? I mean, I, I presume that uh, all the Azure blockchain as a service stuff will will have Cocoa sort of built in and you can use that to launch a network. But what about these other um uh, blockchain projects. Yeah, you know, um, a, a large fraction of the investment that we're making has to do with uh, PaaS and sort of horizontal SaaS built on top of blockchain. And Bletchley is that vision for this connected set of services, many of them existing that can be used in a uh, in a in a in a thoughtfully constructed way to enable enterprises to to take advantage of blockchain as a shared data layer in many different kinds of business applications. And so that's a big area of focus for the team. It's sort of a whole different topic. But one of the things that that seemed important to us was that the base foundation be sound for enterprise use. And I, you know, it, it, it became clear that enterprises would have trouble adopting the PaaS and SaaS that we're working on in the Bletchley vision if the blockchain was not able to address their needs in terms of confidentiality, scalability, performance, governance. And so we think that Coco and Bletchley are, um, are, are sort of self, two self-reinforcing investments, but they're two very different investments. Bletchley is really a, a cloud platform play Coco is not. Coco seeks to be the foundation of blockchain for the enterprise, uh, wherever blockchain in the enterprise is running. So it can be running on premises, in our cloud, in another cloud. It will be made available in, in, in as open source for free for uh, enterprises to use and, into, and, and for ledger manufacturers to integrate. Um, and it will work on both Windows and Linux. So it's going to have very broad applicability. And as an open source project, we're not looking, for example, to directly monetize Cocoa. Um, but we do think that it's a necessary investment to get enterprise adoption that then in turn can take advantage of the uh, innovation in Bletchley. Oh, definitely. I, I could see a lot of value in that. Uh, so at the moment, um, you've written a white paper uh, to which we'll link in the show notes. Is there an implementation of Cocoa that people can you know, download and, and use at this, at this time? So where we are today is that we've built what we demonstrated. We took uh, uh, vanilla Ethereum, we modified it to run on top of uh, the Cocoa framework in its current uh, form, and we uh, adapted, uh, we worked with Mojix. Mojix adapted an application to run on top of that, and that's what we demonstrated uh, in the demo that we did. Um, we're working right now towards a V1 release of Cocoa in 2018. That would be an open source release. Uh, over the course of the fall, we'll be working on that, and we'll probably be working on that with some of the partners that we've already announced, Intel with uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth, uh, R3 with Corda, uh, JP Morgan Chase with Quorum, uh, we'll be working on incorporating Cocoa into those ledgers uh, and then ultimately, again, get to an open source release in 2018 that I think will open it up to to, to broader uh, consumption. Cool. Well, uh, definitely be looking forward to that. And so uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. It was a fascinating episode and uh, look forward to uh, having you back on in the future, perhaps when, you, uh, when Microsoft releases the open source framework and we start seeing applications being built um, uh, on Cocoa-enabled networks. Hey, I really appreciate the time and the wonderful conversation and questions. Thank you so much.
And thank you to our listeners for once again tuning in. Uh, Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. Of course, if you want to support the show, there's multiple ways you can do that. You can leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. It always helps people find the show and uh, we appreciate it greatly. And you can also leave us a tip and the tipping address will be, as always, in the show description. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.